Okay, cool. So I'm just going to wait a sec for you guys to catch up. Um, I What I've done is that I've kept the other stream open so I can see the questions and comments and stuff. Okay. So before I actually get into the essay and my thoughts about the essay and stuff like that, I'm just going to read the comments and stuff from the last stream. So hello to everyone. I mean, you're not all here yet, but I'm just, I'm going to like name drop all of you. Hello, Vf. Hello, Frau. Hello, Yogi. Um, Ella is here. Um, oh, Uta is here. Or was here. Oh, Caitlin. This is the weirdest analogy I've ever heard. I don't remember. I wonder which analogy that was a reference to. Oh, the pubes thing. Yeah. Mm. Oh, Stefan is here. Um. Oh, Uta says, hey, dropping in for a minute to give the news that Aaron Jackson is the first black woman in the world to win gold in a 500 meter speed skate. No men in women's sports. Amazing. Um... Oh, Stefan says, I remember Julia Long discussing Marilyn Fry in a Women's Declaration International Sunday morning Rad Femme read. Amazing. I had no idea. I really need to keep better track of those things. Um, hello, Karen. Okay. Well, I hope some of you guys are here. Oh, yeah, you're here. Okay. <laughs> VF, hello again, all my turf Valentine friends. Guten Abend, Frau. I gotta go to lunch. Have a great day, ladies. Okay, so this is very casual. Um, I think I'm gonna actually go and get food because I realized it's 3.30 and I haven't eaten today. Oh my god. Okay, do you know what happened before this? I'm just gonna like, this is casual. It's whatever. So, you know, I was like streaming this morning, right? Then I had my Zoom call that I didn't realize what time it was at and I had to abruptly stop. So I went to my Zoom call. Then after my Zoom call, I drove my cellist friends somewhere with their cellos because, you know, it's like snow and stuff. And then I was like, okay, I'm going to go home. But first, I deserve a coffee. And so today we are unsponsored by Tim Hortons. This is my iced coffee. I am very disappointed. I said light ice, extra sugar. You know what they fucking did? Light ice and no sugar unacceptable how am i supposed to even ingest this thing i don't know but here we are okay um i'm gonna go get some food and i'll be like right back and then we can discuss the book because i'm like starving i'll be right back also please enjoy momo sleeping there momo momo At least she's on the bed today. It's kind of visible. Okay, I'll be back in a sec. This should definitely be microwaved, but, you know, that's life. I have rice, chicken shawarma, and a fuck ton of tahum and tahini. I fucking love that shit. Tahum is like the garlic sauce. More. At least I think that's what it's called with Lebanese one. I remember. Okay.
Mama. I kind of want to, like, go closer to her. Should we try... Remember I floated the idea of doing a stream from my bed? Should we do that right now so we can be next to Momo? She might leave. Let's try it. Mama. Actually, with, like, the food and the coffee and stuff, it's highly impractical. She's in the frame. It's good enough. Okay. So, this essay... Nothing against the last essay. Oppression, that was a good essay. This essay is like, there was stuff in it that I agreed with and I disagreed with. I honestly felt like it was like exercise for my brain. Like I was being stretched in both directions kind of thing. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, okay. <clears throat> We're quite a ways through the book already. I don't know. Like what is that? Like At least 30% through the book, I'd say. 25% through the book. Okay. Start from the beginning. So, sexism. So. <sighs> she talks about at the beginning how, you know, it's like important for we have feminists to be able to define sexism. And like, okay, not to be like overly critical of her, but like, that's why we're here. So, <clears throat> And, like, the second page of the essay, she has, like, this little, like, blurb, which is, like, this was my original definition of sexism. And then it seems to me, like, what's happening is throughout the essay, she is adding on, like, a deeper understanding of the societal mechanisms of sexism. But then she doesn't give us, like, a new final definition of sexism, at least not that I witnessed. So maybe her thought is that you need, like, the entire understanding to really get it. There isn't, like, a one phrase that can describe sexism, perhaps. But I don't know. I feel, because I feel like she set forth in the beginning, you know, like, my goal is to give a definition of sexism. And she didn't really give, like, a concise one at the end. But whatever. Um, um, Stefan says the pube analogy is out there, but probably for a reason. No, I think it's good. It's to point out the absurdism of... I, I, I found this essay very challenging. I, I really enjoyed that. Because on one hand, she was pointing out the similarities between the sexes and saying, like, you know, why do we need to differentiate so much? And on the other hand, she was pointing out, like, the differences between the sexes and, like, what is diff like what is the differences between them? And the pube analogy is, to me, it's, like, with the food specifically, like, it's kind of crazy. It's like saying you can never sit down and, like, <clears throat> okay, let's pretend that we are in, like, a very patriarchal time period and location. You know, like, you don't leave your house without a chaperone level of patriarchal um, power over the women, okay? And so, if a woman wants to leave the house, she needs a man to, like, escort her. She wants to eat at a tea house. She needs a man to pay the bill to sit there with her. Imagine if instead of it being on the lines of who has a penis and who has a vagina, if it was on the lines of, like, who has brown hair and non-brown hair. Like, it's just completely absurd. And I think she was just trying to, like, point out the absurdity of, like, um, differentiating access to things in life based on penis, not penis, you know? Um. <laughs> Frau says, animals dream about their everyday like we do. So if they live with humans, they dream about those humans, their environments, and what they do together. VF says, my cat is obsessed with it as it is. I want to believe she dreams ab about catching a moose or something. <laughs> now, VF, I know you're not going to agree with everything that was in the essay. I don't agree with everything that's in the essay. But I thought it was, like, an interesting read. Um, okay. So, this is her, like, let's, let's read again. Um, let's read again this, um... Her original definition of sexism before it evolves. Her original definition of sexism is the term sexist is in its core and perhaps most fundamental meaning is a term which characterizes anything, what whatever, which creates, constitutes, promotes, or exploits any irreverent or impertinent markings of the distinction between the sexes. So basically, I'm going to summarize that in my own words. She's saying what sexism is, is when you differentiate based on sex when it is not necessary. Um, so, you know, like, like, 
you need someone to do a math job. Both the man and the woman can do the math job. You hire the man because you think men are more math minded or something. So it's like it literally has nothing to do with like the capability of the person. It's like a separate level of judgment that has nothing to do with the actual person. Um, there is no sexism against men. Yeah, I agree. Um, don't be sorry for talking about cats, Frau. Cats are amazing. Um, Frau, are you a lesbian? Okay. Then, here we go. So she, she gets like a bunch of stuff where she talks about that. Then here later on she goes, So what did I mean to say about sexist? I was thinking in the case of job candidates, okay. I had failed in the first essay fully to grasp or understand the locus of sexism is primarily in the system of framework, not in the particular act. So she is saying that the main issue with sexism is not even like the particular actions that people take, but like the social consciousness and awareness with which everyone appro uh, approaches every single interaction. Like that that's where the sexism starts rather than the actions that have been taken. Um, that's, I like, yeah, interesting. Um, hi, Aqua. Uh, cats, cats, cats. <laughs> Frau, what do you mean might be? <laughs> Frau, I have a 50 kilo dog. Oh my god, I love dogs. All I mean, okay, honestly, not don't tell Momo. I hope she doesn't understand in English. I actually got her as a consolation because I wanted a dog. <laughs> like, I grew up with um, dogs. And um, where's my phone? Now oh, here it is. Oh, it's like a bunch of bunch of notifications. Go away. There. This is my first dog, Tabby. She weighed four pounds. She lived to be 14, I think. Um, yeah, anyway, I wanted to get a dash hound. There was, like, one for adoption where I was living. But then I was like, I'm a student. Like, I'm never fucking home. The poor dog. So I got Momo instead. Like, I told you guys the story yesterday of how I got Momo, right? Um, or this morning. Whatever. That I had friends with this girl who came back from her home country at the end of the summer. And she had to move out quickly because her boyfriend was cheating on her and was like, do you want my cat? And I was like, yeah. Anyway, so... Yes, that sexism is less about the individual acts and more about the the psychological context in which one approaches people of the opposite sex. <clears throat> Aqua is like Momo is better. Um, oh, about how I got Momo. Okay, so, uh, so the, I went to like a very cheap university, so we had tons of international students. Like more than half the music program was international students, and so it was a lot of Chinese students and. <laughs> The first year that I had, like, my own apartment and I wasn't living in res, every single one of the, the Chinese students from the strings program was like, can I put my mattress and, like, a couple boxes in your living room? And I was like, yeah. And so I had, like, seven mattresses and, box like, piles of boxes in my living room. So my living room was, like, unusable for a summer. <laughs> anyway, so this um, master's violinist came back from China, um, and it was, like, two days before school was going to start. And she came to my house, you know, like, to get her stuff. Um, and while she was, like, while I was helping her put it in her car and everything, she was saying, um, you know, she came back and she just found her boyfriend was cheating on her. And his, his defense of this was that it's just, like, porn. And it's, like, at the time I was, like, that's bullshit. But actually I'm, like, isn't that true, though, from his perspective? Like... Porn is, like, a thing you use to get off. Woman, a thing you use to get off. Like, you know, like a douchebag man. Okay. Um, anyway, so she was, like, she decided, like, well, as soon as she found out that he was cheating on her, she was, like, I have to move out. And so she moved into, like, a rooming house that was, like, across from the university. And you couldn't bring um, pets. And so while I was helping her move her stuff, um, she was basically saying, like, you know, and I can't leave my cat with him because, you know, he doesn't change the litter. He doesn't really feed her. Like, she's not um good there and then um I was telling her like I was thinking of getting like a kitten so she was like no no take my cat so I did um and also when I got her she was like really really scared the first day I brought her home she spent like seven hours under the couch and then um my apartment was like a hundred year old house where they like turned each of the floors into a bed uh, into an apartment so the main floor my bedroom was like the former dining room and it had like like a china cabinet built into the wall and i filled it with like linens and clothes and bedding and stuff and momo would like go inside and like dig in the clothes and just like hide and i wouldn't be able to find because <laughs> she'd be like hiding um 
Anyway, um, one day I was in orchestra with the master's violinist, um, like, you know, months after I had Momo. And I don't even know what I was saying to her, but she basically was like, yeah, Momo is a bad cat. If you want her to listen, you have to hit her. And suddenly it made sense to me why the cat is always hiding under the couch and doesn't like cuddles and doesn't like being petted because you fucking hit your cat, man. Like, yeah. Frau says, I recently recorded a podcast of one of, and one of the guests had a cat on her lap. If you listen carefully, you can hear the cat purring on and off. I've done that before in my early streams where I would like pick up Momo while she's purring and bring her to the mic and everybody would be like Purr, in the live chat. <laughs> but it's hard because she's not she's not like a she doesn't purr that much um so you have to really get her in the right mood and then when you pick her up usually she stops so yeah the cat was abused yes that's true so i'm fucking glad i got her because i don't know what they would have done with her otherwise um look i remember getting her out of the apartment like the litter box was one solid stone the like food dishes were disgusting they hadn't been cleaned in months like, because she left for the summer, like, left the cat with the boyfriend, and this is what he did. Um, yeah, that she used to hit Momo, apparently. Um, FVF says she's obviously a shy one. I don't even know if she's obviously a shy one. Maybe she wouldn't have been shy if she hadn't been abused by her first owner, right? Um, now she's more cuddly, though. Like, she's not cuddly cuddly, but, like, if she's, like, lying down and purring and I lie down next to her, she won't immediately run away. Um, that kind of stuff. So she's gotten much better. Like, when I first got her, it was, like, a struggle to even, like, pet her without her running away so frau says never trust a man who treats animals badly it tells you a lot about how he'll treat women and kids yes exactly um i was listening to some of those reddit threads and there was like a couple of them about um like a reddit thread about divorce and like a bunch of the lawyer it was like asking lawyers about like what's the craziest reason that people got divorced and a bunch of them were like this woman wanted to divorce her husband because he couldn't stop overfeeding the dog. Or this woman wanted to divorce her husband because, like, he was hitting the dog. And then the lawyers were like, lol, that's so crazy. And I'm like, no, it's an indicator of his state of mind. It's not crazy. Um. 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 Yeah. Okay. Anyway. So... Yeah, I I enjoyed this a lot because, okay, I have had discussions, obviously, with women about, um you know, sex markers in society. That, like, the behavior you do that indicates, like, this is a woman, this is a man, right? And I have had discussions with women about, like, criticism of femininity and stuff, like, obviously. But for the way that she describes it, it's, it's you know, I've never heard this before, like, sex identification, sex markers, um... What was the other one she used? Like sex confirmation patterns or something like that. And how... So we already... This... it I don't know. I just... I, I feel like it's expanded my understanding of it. And I really am appreciating of that. So... um, Some of you brought up heels before. Heels restrict the movement of a woman. Are meant to make her look more sexually appealing. And um, like are a very clear indicator. This is a female. Right? And it's like, why are radical feminists against that? Well, for one, it's like, you know, limits mobility and hurts your body in the long run and is like sexually objectifying, right? But also this kind of like, by, by practicing femininity, by performing femininity, you are marking yourself as the subjugated class saying, yes, I'm willing to do the things that mark me as subordinate. I'm willing to do the work to show you I'm subordinate. This is me submitting to you by doing these things, complying with it. Um, I really liked that kind of perspective on it. Um, <clears throat> okay. Here we go. Oh, fuck. This, all of this is so relevant. I love this essay. Okay, so she talks about how this student of hers introduced her to this kid, Pat, or person. I don't know. I don't know. I assume she's like a 20-year-old or something. Okay. <clears throat> that I have two repertoires for handling introductions to people was vividly confirmed for me when a student introduced me to his friend, Pat. And I really could not tell what Pat's sex was. For a moment, I was stopped cold. Completely, completely incapable of action. I felt myself helplessly caught between two paths. The one that I would take if Pat was female. The one that I would take if Pat were male. Um, this to me 
is uh, for I was like give me a pair of docks any day actually my current docks I broke them in badly or something and they just like stab and cut my feet and they're very uncomfortable and it's very sad because docks are expensive anyway so <clears throat> yeah let's let's compare this statement with the trans crap so trans activists the whole point of like non-binary or whatever was to specifically get this this exact uh reaction that somebody comes up to you they're going to interact with you and then they stop wait am i interacting with this person as a female or a male and like you know they say that they're doing that to like reduce sexism but i'm like you're just creating like another way for people to treat you like you're not reducing the way that people treat women shitty anyway um anyway so i found that very interesting um and yeah, like, I remember reading this, that exact spot. I remember consciously noticing that a Tim was male and going to treat them as a male and stopping myself and saying, no, 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 you recognize that this person is a male, but you don't treat them as a male. You treat them the way that they feel inside. Um, and at some point she said something about how it would be like disrespecting your self-perception or something like that to ignore these things and i i something along those lines she said and i very i found that quite um poignant <laughs> then she talks about how socially taboo it is to treat males and females in identical ways or not treat them in the way that they're supposed to be treated and this is what you view with women like karen right she is not demurring she is not submitting she is not acquiescing to anything she speaks forthrightly to men the way that a man speaks to another man when a woman does that holy fuck stop the presses um i think we should all do that <laughs> Stop behaving according to your conditioning. Don't give them what they want. You deserve better. Um, also, this uh, this makes so much sense to me. I, I just love the way she articulated it. Here she said, The frequency with which our sex behavior... Or, sorry. The frequency with which our behavior marks the sexes of those we interact with cannot be exaggerated. The phenomenon is absolutely pervasive and deeply entrenched in all... Of the patterns of society, which are habitual, customary, acceptable, tolerable, and intelligible. One can invent ways of being in one situation and... Okay, whatever, whatever. Oh, this is the wrong part. But, like, um, sex marking behavior is not optional. It is obligatory. It is as, ob as obligatory as it is pervasive. There's one part... I don't know. It's I guess it's not here. There's one part where she says, um, The first thing you notice about a man before you notice anything else is his sex. And that indicate the first thing you're noticing is that his privilege, right? And the first thing you notice about a woman before you notice anything else is her sex, and that indicates her her um, subordination. Um, and I found that like very, very like concise and powerful. I I love that statement. Um, that makes so much sense. And like again, I apply it to queer theory. You're in a setting of queer people. The first thing you notice about a Tim, he's a man. So even though you're thinking like I have to treat this like a woman you're going to sub subordinate yourself because that's what you've been trained to do, right? The first thing you notice about him is his privilege before you notice, oh yeah, he's not supposed to have privilege. Same thing with Tim, with Tiffs. First thing you notice about a Tiff, oh, she's like me. She's oppressed um, on the basis of her sex. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, wipe that out of your mind. No, no, this is a, a privileged person. Um... <clears throat> Yes, um, Salinga says, what's that saying to really oppress a group, get them up to get them oppressing themselves? That's what she concludes the chapter with. I think it's the second last page or sorry, chapter essay, whatever. She concludes the chapter by saying the physical, the material resources necessary to forcibly um, subjugate a population is considerable. It is much more efficient to convince them that they are inevitably subjugated so they won't even fight back they'll just go along with it because they think this is like inevitable and natural and that that is like a huge part of what patriarchy has accomplished to convince women that it's normal 
natural, um, inevitable that they are subjugated. And I think that that, um, I mean, I know some women here have like differing opinions on compulsory heterosexuality and whatever, but I think that is part of like what it took, why it took me so long to get out of that is because I really thought it was like inevitable on some level that I couldn't articulate. I really thought it was like, <sighs> if not in my nature, then in the nature that society thinks people are supposed to have. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if I'm clear, but um, okay. Then she talks here about how, here, in, in everything one does, one has two complete repertoires of behavior, one for interactions with women and one for interactions with men. So I wouldn't even say it so much as like interacting with women and men. I would say interacting with people who are the same as you and interacting with people who are different than you, right? And this really, really um, is exemplified, in my opinion, with the comfort and safety women feel around other women, you know? Like, if you're ever in a group that's all women, in like a room, you're in a room that's all women, one man walks in, immediately your, the physical sense of your body changes slightly, slightly. You have to be paying attention. Like, the way you're thinking changes. Why? Because one guy walked in. Because he's different than you. The way you act towards people who are the same as you is completely different than the way you act towards the people who are different than you. Um... <clears throat> And it's like based on what she was saying, like the first thing you notice about a person is their sameness or differenceness between you and them. Um, Stefan says, it is a very interesting topic. I don't know how to act with a human if you don't know their sex. It seems more than understanding the power dynamic. It seems to me that sex is important to understand. Yeah. Um, and I guess that's kind of her point with the sexism is that it's not so much about ignoring sex, but saying, you know, this is a female I need to treat them accordingly in a respectful, positive way, right? Like, you like for example, if there is a man and a woman, and both of them are like pregnant, so the man has a husband, has a wife who's pregnant, and the woman herself is pregnant. You won't treat them identically, right? Because one of them is going to give birth and the other one isn't, right? Like, I don't know, maybe that's a bad example, but I'm just saying, like, you shouldn't treat them identically. You should treat them like with respect from the basis of their sex. Um, um vf in response to me saying that um <clears throat> um we're t women are supposed to view um subordination to men is like natural and um, in uh, unavoidable she said um yes women are groomed into that that's the whole ass point of gender roles yes which she makes at the end the point that she makes at the end of the oh hello patricia um <clears throat> Frau Fantastic says the dynamic changes straight away with the bloke in the room, yeah. Or, like, even maybe even more noticeable is if you are in, like, a setting completely of men and you walk out into... Like, to me, the my early memories of feeling this is in, like, um, religious situations. Or, I don't know if the situation... Whatever. To me, that was quite a religious situation. So, visiting Mennonite family, and all of the women are in the kitchen, like, you know, all ten of them with their daughters are in the kitchen, cooking cleaning things up, setting the table. All the men are in the living room watching the hockey game or whatever. And if you walk in between the rooms, you feel. It feels different. It, your physical sensation in your body feels different. Why? Because you're alert. These are potential predators. These are potential allies. Um, um, Aquarina says, men go in the men file in my brain. Uh, where they get hyper watched women i don't even worry about them unless they show me they're not right they just go in the women yeah um yeah yeah exactly like imagine you get on the subway in the middle of the night there's no one on the subway car except one person if that person is a male how are you going to behave you're going to sit so you can see the male you're going to be quite far away from them right you're going to be alert to what's going on with this guy you get into the subway car at night by yourself there's just another woman there you're not going to be exercising the same level of caution right um and is it because this woman sex signaled with her style and her hairdo and all this crap no we that women do not base our feeling of safety or potential um risk on hairstyle clothing mannerism we base it on sex those things are all on top of sex that's gender doesn't matter 
Like, when it comes to this situation, that doesn't matter. Um, well, I mean, unless you're homophobic, in which case, then it would matter to you. But, okay. I guess she's asleep. Um, Ocarina says, if you paid me $10,000 to spend a night locked in a stadium with 1,999 women, I don't know. Um, No worries. Make it 199 men. Hell no, I'm not crazy. Yeah. Um, Okay. So yeah, she talks about that. Let us see. So here she says, sex marking behavior is not optional. It is an obligatory, it is as obligatory as it is pervasive. So what does she mean when she says this? She means that society punishes and rewards you based on your compliance with sex signaling. Um, this is why, like in part, lesbians face homophobia. They're not conforming to gender roles, and society is like, whoa, what the fuck is that? We have to punish people who don't comply. Um Oh, Karina being locked up with 199 won't for a night would be fun. Um, Frau says, this is why you should never dampen down your intuition, as Gavin De Becker points out in The Gift of Fear. Exactly. Exactly. We really need to, like, it's... Women have that sense for a reason. It's, like, evolutionary that it's, hel- it's to help you protect yourself. Don't disrespect all of the experience of your foremothers by ignoring that shit, tamping it down, learning to dismiss it. It is important. You deserve the protection that it can afford you. To whatever extent it exists. Um, <laughs> VF, I would do it for free if it was 199 women. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, let's keep going. Um, so, this is quite a long one too, eh? It took me about an hour to read it. I think this one was 30 pages. Yeah, we started on started on page 17 and ended on page 40. Okay, it was more like 25 pages. I can't do math. All right. So here's the next page. Yeah, listen to this phrase here now. <laughs> VF's like, I know a good party idea when I hear one just say. <laughs> okay. Um. Oh, fuck. What was I about to read? Here. If one is permitted sexual expression or gratification or even mere feeling with persons of one sex but not the other, one has to know what sex each person is before one can allow one's heart to beat or one's blood to flow in erotic enjoyment of that person. So basically, you can't feel sexual attraction towards women on the basis that they're women if you can't recognize that they're women. This is like a telling off of queer theory bullshit, in my opinion. Um, Mar- uh, Aqua Marina is like, pour one out for a TT or cuttlefish queen. Yes. Okay. She talks about how socialization is not just about, um, you know, the clothing that you wear or the way you physically present yourself. It is also about the way that you, um, um, you, your mannerism and like your physical behavior, like your physical movement in the world. Um, Also, I love when she was like, you don't go to a job interview wearing other sexes, shoes, and socks. I literally... Okay, this is from the women's section at Old Navy. I'm trying to think what else I'm wearing. Everything... Last time I went to a job interview, every single piece of clothing I was wearing was a men's clothing. I just thought that was funny. Um... 
Oh, S Stefan says it's our reptilian brain. Yeah, that like the the like um like the alert mechanism. <laughs> VF says TT gets the whole bottle. Yeah. Um. Okay. Oh yes, then. She goes into this whole thing about how intersex is not really male or female, or they're, like, ambiguously male and female. And I was very surprised by this. Like I said, she says that the formation of these essays happened mostly in the 70s, and this book was published in 1983. So I was very surprised to read that. Um, but her her criticism seems to be not... She's not pr supporting the queer theory, like, in the way that it is now. She's saying... There are individuals who are ambiguous, right? And that is fucked up of, of us as a society to try and force them into those boxes by like surgically and chemically altering them as children, let them be. That's good. That is not definitely the opposite of what queer theorists think about intersex kids. Um, but also, I kind of, I feel the way I do about queer theorists when they bring this up. It's like you're discussing like societal sex differences in roles it's like how many times have you been in a situation where you couldn't tell if someone was male or female and instead of being like i think this person is like gender non-conforming or like you know this woman is like a bit of a deeper voice a bit of a stronger jaw instead of thinking these things you think oh my god maybe this woman is like intersex it's like no so it's irrelevant really um Okay. I, I like this phrase too. I know that it's in reference to the intersex um, children specifically, but I think it can be applied in other ways. This phrase here, even being physically quote unquote normal for one's assigned sex is not enough. Also, she used the terms assigned sex. Very interesting to me. I wonder... Like, if she was writing this in the late 70s, like, where did she get that in, that language and why did she choose to use it? Um, one must be male or female actively. Again, the costumes and performances. Yeah. So it's not enough for, like, think about it this way, right? Like a butch lesbian. I think that most women see a butch lesbian, they think, oh, it's a woman, right? But it's not enough to... Um, FVF, I think it's kind of silly to say that she's a true light. She's literally a separatist. Like, this is, like, one thing that she's said that it doesn't align. And then she ends up trying to make it to make the point of separatism anyway. Or, like, anyway. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what was I saying? Yes. So, even if a female... Oh, hey, dragon. No, I know it's been a, a long, a long... Oh, that's why she used it, because she's specifically referring to intersex children. Okay, there's no mystery here. She's literally specifically referring to people who had their sex assigned to them. Okay. But, yes. Again, the costumes and the performance. So, even if a lesbian is immediately identifiable as a female, what is unacceptable is that she is not performing the female role to the hilt. Right? Um, okay. One helps to create a world in which one, in which it seems to us that we could never mistake a man for a woman or a woman for a man. We need never worry. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. Um, yeah. So then she talks about this like information theory thing and how. It seems so important for us to know the sexes of the people that we're interacting with. They use these, like, gender signals in, like, so many ways all at once. Um, like she said, there is not one way to signal your sex. There's a thousand ways. Um, she says, I suspect that this is the single topic on which we... We most frequently receive information from others throughout our entire lives. Yeah, it's very interesting. Um, which is why, like, okay, so 
The premise of most of this chapter is that when you perceive a female or a male, the first thing you notice about them is that they're female or male. Given that, it's quite astonishing what the queer community has accomplished, right? To be like, oh, we don't know. How can you know? Like, how can you say you know? When it's like, if that's the primary form of data that you receive most every time you come in contact with a person, it's kind of insane that, like, you know, from the millions of practice you have that you would somehow not be able to do it. Hello, Matt Adam. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, then she talks about something that I kind of talked about yesterday, which is, um, so gender is very, very visible, right? You know, like long hair, short hair, heels, not heels, tight fitting clothes, like comfortable, like this is very, very visible, right? But the most essential part, I can't believe I talked about this yesterday. It's like I'm in the fucking matrix. The most visible part of your gender or your, sorry, your sex. <laughs> wow. The most visible part of your sex is your genitalia, right? The most obvious. And that is the one that is always hidden. And so to me and her, that leaves this kind of like ambiguity. Um, furthermore, the same culture which drives us to this constant information exchange also simultaneously enforces a strong blanket rule requiring that the simplest and most nearly definitive physical manifestations of sex difference be hidden from view in all but the most private and intimate circumstances. The double message of sex distinction and its preeminent importance is conveyed, in fact, in part by devices which systemically and deliberately cover up and hide from view the few physical things which do, to a fair extent, distinguish two sexes, the two sexes of humans. The, message, the messages are overwhelmingly dissociated from the concrete facts they su pur supposedly pertain to, and from matrices of concrete and sensible reason and consequences. So she's saying, like, society is supposed to operate in a way that you treat people based on their sex, based on their performance of the sex. Um, oh, sorry, their performance of the sex roles rather than the actual visibility of what their sex is. Um, yeah. And that it's kind of, like, insane that we're supposed to, like, be so focused on sex and yet the thing that actually denotes sex, we're supposed to, like, pretend we can't see it and don't want to see it and ignore it. It's a bit, like, mind-boggling. Um, Stefan said, It is so fucked. Yes, a Jedi mind trick. To me, it sounds like no water is not always wet. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So, yes. The, you know, constantly signaling gender, but hiding sex. Um, Small children's minds must be hopelessly boggled by all of this. For sure, man. Um, like, I mean, gender specifically, not sex. Obviously, kids are not boggled by the concept of sex. But gender, yes. Um, a friend of mine whose appearance and style have a little bit about them that is gender ambiguous, walked past a mother and a child and heard the child ask the mother, is she a man or a woman? The struggle to divine some connection between social behavior and physical sex and the high priority of it all seem painfully obvious here. And it's like he, the child even said, is she a man or a woman? So he recognized her sex, but it, he couldn't comprehend it because the gender markers didn't line up with the sex in the like traditional way he expected it. Okay, I'm going to eat a bit of food. Mama. Mama, baby, you sleepy? Okay. 
Mm. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Stefan says, not sure I made sense. I meant TRA say we cannot tell who's a man or a woman. It sounds to me like prove that water is wet. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Dragon asked if I'm keeping these up. Anything to do with book readings is going to stay up and stay public. It is only the Benji soapboxes that get taken down. Okay. Okay. Or even more, in more absurd perhaps, Stefan, is TRA say we can't tell who's a man or woman. And I say, no, I can tell. And they say, you can't trust your eyes. Like, they're trying to convince me that I can't tell what I'm actually looking at. It's even more absurd than telling me the water isn't wet. Well, maybe not, but like, you know, from your self-perception. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, listen to this. This I found so interesting. She says, If one is made to feel that a thing is of prime importance, but common sensory experience does not connect it with things of obvious, concrete, practical importance, then there is a mystery. And with that, a strong tendency to construct to the construction of mystical or metaphysical conceptions of its importance. So we're constantly told there's like a very important difference between men and women. Like that's what we have to constantly know, the difference between men and women. And yet, she says, um, but common sensory experience does not connect it with things of obvious or practical importance. So she's saying, if you're constantly given the message that gender is super, super important, but you don't have any practical experience that tells you that gender is super, super important, it, it becomes this thing where you can, like, make up bullshit about it because it's all based on, like, things that are hard to pin down, which is, I think, how we got to this point with gender. Um... Matt Adams says, I think as people get older, it gets far easier to pick up on subtle physical markers to distinguish sex, even if the stereotypical markers like clothing and stuff aren't there. Mm -hmm. Frau says, kids know who is a man and who is a woman, just like they know both chihuahuas and wolfhounds are dogs. Yeah. Um, but then Dragon was mentioning the stuff they're teaching in schools. Yeah. The stuff they're teaching in schools in Canada, like federally, the entire country, they're teaching like, you know, like G.I. Joe or Barbie. Like, where do you fit on the gender spectrum? Like, what are your pronouns like in kindergarten? So they're all going to be fucked in the head. Okay. Um, yes. So because we put so much importance on gender, and because gender doesn't actually matter, it gives us room to, within our constant focus and attention and energy you've spent on it, to create a bunch of bullshit. Because there's nothing of substance there. Process we learn to discern quite quickly, and VF says my generation is way better at it than those older and those younger now. Hmm. VF says voices make it very easier to tell. Yeah, I think voices is probably like the best indicator. Um, because there are, you know, men who have like small hands, men who have narrow shoulders, all these things, but voice really, even if they have like gay boy voice, that's different than a woman's voice, you know? Like, a voice, I think, is, like, the, probably the best voice and speech patterns. Yeah, that too. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I forgot about that. So, when I was, like, a teenager, you know how I say like all the time and I say um all the time? Boys don't talk that way. Have you noticed? It's, like, it's very uncommon for men to use so many fellow words. Um, and literally, I stopped speaking. I mean, I've talked about this before. I would literally go into trans spaces and be like, my name is Benji, he, him, that's it. And then like not speak because I thought my voice gives me away as feminine, um, as female. And it was like shameful to me that I'm trying to present as a man. And then the words, the, the, the speech patterns I use are like some stupid teenage girl. Like it was like shameful to me. So I literally didn't talk. I literally silenced myself. And it's like, like, okay. I know that it's obviously not like some TRA sat me down and was like, you shouldn't talk. But this is a very common thing among young trans men who are trying to pass. Um, and it's like, how can you call your movement feminist when a literal physical outcome of your ideology is that women do not speak at all? You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's like completely anti-feminist. Anyway. Uh... Stefan says the way people move, yes. Their physical mannerism, yes. 
Um, you'll notice that too. Like if you're ever at night, you know, and you're like walking on the street and someone's on the other side of the street, out of the corner of your eye, I think you catch their gait before you really notice like their physical characteristics. You know what I mean? Like the way they move, you notice that before you see how they really look. Um, and yes, that, yeah. Oh, Frau says, and women check in more, don't you think? Like, okay, oh my god, yeah. So, like, also, you would, like, start and end sentences by being, like, I think, or, like, maybe, or, like, um, like, you'll say something, and you'll be, like, oh, well, at least in my opinion, or at least that's what I think. Like, women feel the need to, um, um, <clears throat> like, present their thoughts and ideas with, like, things before and after, I don't know the right language for this, but things before and after that give, like, give them wiggle room to be, like, oh, that's not exactly what I said, or, like, oh, I didn't mean literally, or, like, to, like, kind of be on the fence about it, whereas men, they just say what they think. Um, yes, that is very true. Dragon says, the testosterone didn't lower my voice much at all, but I would strain my voice to deepen it. Glad I'm free of that. Oh my god, yeah. Did you ever do those? Remember they used to recommend these things all the time and nobody talks about them anymore? Like, voice exercises to do in the shower? Like, there's all of these, there used to be all these YouTube videos for trans men. I don't really, I've never really heard about that in the last couple years. That were, because like, it used to be, like I mentioned this before, it used to be kind of like, if you want something, you should work towards that goal. And then if you need hormones and surgery, then that's like, a supplement to that right but um with voice especially there used to be all of these youtube videos that were like trans man voice training and it was like it would like you would do the exercise like with the video and then you would like make your shower really hot like lots of steam in the washroom and then you would do it again and again and it was supposed to like stretch out your vocal cords or something but it would like hurt and i only did it a couple times um but i know people who did it like a lot for a long time and they basically just damaged their voice and if you like, a damaged woman's voice, I guess, sounds kind of more masculine. But, like, it's really horrific. <clears throat> VS says, I can deepen my voice naturally to sing R&B if I want. But I got range that T would totally fuck up. Yeah, like, um, what is Kat Kattinson. She talks about that, how she has a little bit of a deeper range, but she's lost some of the higher register um, in, um, in her singing. Frau says, voice work for trans is a grift. Yeah. Um, Madam says the way people move definitely. I don't move around very feminine, but I do get clocked as a lesbian, not a man, which is true. Haha. No, me too. Um, I, I, <laughs> my mom always used to tell me when I was a kid that I walk like a man. I need to like walk more ladylike, and I literally was like, "What does that even mean?" Um, and I think what it means is that if you put on a dress, it looks awkward because you walk in the way that you're not supposed to walk when you wear a dress. I think the definition of a ladylike walking is, like, the walking that you could do in, like, a short skirt or something. Like, it's so fucking... Who cares? Um... Okay. So. So then she makes the point that because um, gender is so um, is so like constantly is such a constant message, and because it's a constant message, right? And because it's not only a message we receive, but something we go and rehearse, that it it seems it seems to make it unquestionably true. That gender is very, very important. Because, I mean, you spend so much time doing it. Like, you spend time doing it. You spend a lot of time hearing about it. You see other people doing it. Well, it must be fucking important. Why else would everybody spend so much fucking time and energy on it? Um, and so, we, because of this, it makes it impossible to think, like, well, it doesn't mean anything. Right? Like, we've gotten to the point where we know gender doesn't mean anything. But it's like I was saying before. Like, if all the data that you input into your brain is that, like patriarchal heteronormative crap like this is very important everybody's doing it all the time lots of time i'm hearing it from many different directions i'm doing it myself 
Like, why would I spend so much time and energy on it if it wasn't important? Why would society send me the message to spend so much time and energy on it if it wasn't important? And so it becomes kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy because you spend so much time and energy on this thing that you make up your own importance to it in your mind. Like, she talks about, like, metaphysical or mystical, like, origins of it because you're like, well, there must be some reason for it. Um, and that's how we ended up with gender. <laughs> So, Stefan says, my mom said I walk like a truck driver. <laughs> um, uh, Aquarius says, Benji, that's Stomposaurus walking. That's what I do. Is it? <laughs> um, so when I come and visit you, we should like film a TikTok of just me and you like walking up a hallway or something. <laughs> um, Dragon says, I look like a drag queen in a dress. Yeah, I feel you. VF says, people... Um, Call it, call me out for having that butch swagger. I don't think I have a swagger. I think I just don't have a feminine walk. I definitely wouldn't say I have any confidence whatsoever. Isn't that what is like a part, big part of um, swagger? Okay. I'm kind of jealous though, because from all of the lesbians I know, apparently if you have swagger, you don't even need to like go looking. The women will come to you. And considering how like, shy i am and i'm never gonna fucking ever like ask someone out that would be like a useful thing anyway okay <clears throat> i love this too <laughs> it's like this is like this is funny it's quite a spectacle really once one sees it that humans dev so devoted to dressing up and acting out and fixing one another so everyone lives up to and lives out the theory that the two are sharply distinct sexes and never the twain shall overlap or be confused or conflated. These hominids constantly, with a remarkable lack of embarrassment, marking the distinction between the two sexes as though their lives depended on it. Yeah. It is pretty obscene. And like, a, a spectacle. That is a great word, I think, to describe it. Okay. Yeah, then she goes on to say, like, the hets, they make fun of or mock the butch femme thing. But she's like, your entire fucking cult, your entire fucking heterosexual culture is like one billion times more concentrated version of that. And you think that's fine, but this is not, it's like, come on. Okay. And that when gays do it, we realize that, like, you know, gender is like preference, performance. It's like, it's, it's not, it's not prescriptive of anything. When the straights do it, they take it, like, super fucking seriously, right? Like, you know, have you heard about those men who, like, they get married, and after they get married, the woman doesn't wear makeup, and they're like, are you even a woman? Like, who are you? Or, like, after they get married, the woman stops shaving, and they're like, I wanted to marry, like, a real woman, and, like, you're, like, a fake woman now. Like, you know what I mean? Like, the heads are so fucking insecure and obsessed with it, it's disturbing. Um, and annoying by heads with boyfriends, well, yeah. Um, Dragon is asking VF if she gets cruised by straight couples. Wait, what would a straight couple want with a butch lesbian? They want to see the lesbian, like, having sex with the woman so the guy can watch? Uh, VF says, I get cruised by so many groups because I'm naturally androgynous. Yeah, my ex was like that. Like, very, very androgynous. So she was like, random people would, like, cruise me all the time. Yeah. Um, Okay. Oh, sex announcing. That was the other term. She used sex marks, sex marking and sex announcing. So here is the page where she talks about comparing it to pubes. I think she was just trying to point out like the spectacle of it and the absurdity of it. That like it doesn't change like which food you eat or how often you eat, but it that it dictates like the conditions under which you're allowed to eat. Like it doesn't make any sense. It has no relevance on either of the things. Um. oh yeah and Frau was like how do you not laugh reading that I was just trying to like make sure I was trying to focus on how making my like having good diction and speaking clearly <laughs> so that I wouldn't laugh um Dragon says I couldn't believe how many men are into butches yeah I yeah I've heard this before um yeah anyway do you think it's a power thing like do you think that they are, like, attracted to, like, the gender presentation of a butch? Or do you think that it's, like, this is, like, the ultimate woman who is not into men? 
and I am like exerting power over her if I get to like do something to her. Do you think it's which of those do you think it is? Um, lots of men fetishize us. I blame Susan. She means Buck Angel for it. Yeah, hard not to. Um, and like I said, Buck Angel, I don't know. I'm pretty sure that she says her sexuality is like, um, um, it's gay light for bi men and rape for hets. Yep. Um, that's what I mean. Like, it's a power thing, right? Dragon says, yeah, I think it's a big score for them. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So then here she talks about how by performing gender, um, women are signaling that they are in the subordinate category and that they are victimizable and that by men performing gender they are signaling that they are in the dominant category and that they are difficult to victimize um so both the man and the woman announce their sex through style of gait clothing hair etc but they are not equally or identically affected by announcing their sex. The male announcement tends towards the protection or safety, and the female announcement tends towards the victimization. So this is, like, this is what I think about. Like, I'm sure you've all heard this, um... So with, like, body image and beauty standards and all this kind of criticism these days, people are like, well, it affects men just as much as it affects women. Which, first of all, fucking bullshit, okay? Like, look at every single, like, eating disorder and body image issue, and then you go and look at the data, and it's, like, 90% women. So, first of all, bullshit, okay? But also the way that it is affecting women is harmful to them the way that it is affecting and like where is the harm for the women they're disfiguring their bodies they're reducing their mobility um they're negatively impacting their health in the long term right and uh men so if a man so they'll be like, you know, I'm supposed to be like muscular and it's like so much like it's like so much pressure, blah, blah, blah. Okay, first of all, men who do not perform masculinity to like a Thor level are still treated with like, you deserve respect because you are a man. First of all, okay. So that's bullshit. That, And second of all, if you are not given, if you are not venerated to the degree that you would like to be because of your performance of masculinity, whose fault is that? Who is it that's not giving you that praise? It's other fucking men. So how is that my fault? Like, men are basically like, you know, other men think I'm wimpy and they don't praise me for being just as manly as them. And it's because the women. How is it because the women? This is all of this men problems with their men bullshit and this men crap. It's nothing to do with me. Um, and then for them to complain about it. It's like you're complaining that the, that you are your default position is to be respected, but you're not being praised enough. Whereas women's default position is to be subjugated, and they're complaining that they want respect. Like seriously, grow the fuck up, man. Okay. Um. Oh, dragon, are you over six foot? Dragon says, "Yeah." And the short men who came after me too. Like, wow, I'm over six foot tall. But then there are a lot of straight women who get mistaken for butches they are usually working on farm yeah that's actually it's so funny when i came out as a lesbian when i was 20 i was living in like a farm town that's where i went to university and because i was trying to like experience something that wasn't like the big city of toronto and um so i shaved my head and started wearing flannel like because when i when i detransitioned i didn't like really change my like gender presentation but i did buzz my head um because i had like a justin bieber type haircut because as those of you who were around back in the day, you remember how there was like all of those blogs that were about like, what is your face shape and what is your hair and how does that make you look more or less men masculine or feminine? So I figured out this was the haircut that helps me like look past as a boy better. And so when I came out as a lesbian, I was like, fuck it, shave my head. And then I was so disappointed because you know what? Having a buzzed head and wearing flannel in a farm community, that does not denote you as a lesbian. That just, like, a lot of the women, they didn't have buzzed heads, but they had, like, quite short hair, like, like this maybe, you right? And, like, jeans and flannel and, like, a pair of boots. That doesn't make them look like lesbians. They look like farm workers. <laughs> so I actually blended it. <laughs> um, where is it? VF said something here, no? 
We have said some of them are also attracted to little boys and think butchers look boyish younger than their age, so it's legal. Yeah, I, I, yes, I've heard of this too. Um, they keep it short for safety. Yeah, like when you're working with like the farm equipment, so it doesn't get caught and stuff. Yeah, and I think probably also facility. Like, they they work so they've worked so many long crazy hours. Can you imagine having to like wake up and blow dry your hair or whatever the fuck every day? I, yeah. Um. Matt Adams said the one and only time I shaved my head was the first was when I first came out. It's like a rite of passage. Yeah. I honestly think all women should do it at least once. Um, you don't realize how much time and energy you spend on your hair. Like even things that you're not doing. Like, for example, when you have longer hair and it's cold outside, you have to have a shower earlier. Well, you don't have to, but usually you'll have a shower earlier so that you don't need to leave the house with like wet hair and be cold. It's like even things like that. It's like you are literally changing your actions and your lifestyle because of the length of your hair like it's kind of insane if you think about it right like you shave your head you don't even need to use conditioner you just wash your hair it's clean you don't need to style it nothing um it's like very very freeing i i really think people should women should do it at least once um yeah sorry i'm listening i thought one of my roommates came home um yeah, I'm kind of wanting to buzz my head again, but then, like, ugh, I invested in all of this very nice, expensive, like, shampoo and conditioner and hair dye material, like, bleaching stuff. Like, I bought it in bulk because, like, the bulk, it was, like, ten times the price for, like, twice, the, or ten times the quantity for twice the price. And I was like, what am I going to do it a few times? Might as well. Anyway, so now it's, like, a sunk cost thing. I have all of these products, and I'm like, I might as well just dye my hair again. And if I'm going to dye my hair, I don't want it to be super short, because then what's the point? I don't know. I actually, I had my hair this length once, and I dyed it green. But then it turned into, like, this kind of green afro, and it was very strange to, like, style. I just buzzed it again. Anyway. Um. VF says, I shaved my head when I came out um, and got clocked as gay by women big time. But was this in Miami or Orlando? Maybe if you had been in a farming town, it would have been different. Um, Matt Adams said, but I started to get a rat tail. Sorry. A rat tail because I didn't know you had to shave the back of your neck frequently, so I abandoned. <laughs> My first ever short haircut was like a pixie cut with a rat tail. It was based on an anime character. And it was lime green. Um, I kept that fucking rat tail for like a year. It was so disgusting. Like, the hair was really, like, split ends and, like, frayed and, like, so frizzy. And I was like, no, it's my rat. <laughs> but, I mean, I was, like, 13, so the cringe is, like, acceptable. V yeah, VF says, VF says I, I loved having a shaved head, but I love my mohawk more. Yeah, because the mohawk is best of both worlds. You have some hair that you can do something with, but it's short enough. Um... That you don't have to like style it. And because it's like short on the sides. It's not on your ears and your neck and crap. Which is what I fucking hate. Um... Aquamina says. The first time I ever saw women's natural body hair. Was on lesbian couples legs. She rose. Now I am delightfully. And uh, now I'm a delightfully furry lady. Yes. Um... Oh. Stefan says. Happily turf time. <laughs> Happy Valentine's Day, Stefan. Um, have a good sleep. Um, yeah. À la prochaine. Uh... <laughs> Frau Fantastic. Short hair and no makeup equals extra time in bed. Literally, though. I wonder how many women... Like... Like... If you are, like, a gender-conforming woman... Like wake up in the morning and time. How long did I how long did I shave my legs? How long did I do my makeup? How long did I blow dry my hair? How long did I do this? How long did I and be like, oh, look, I spend an hour every day doing this. Is my t is my time worth that? Is that is that a don't I have better things to do with my life than stylize myself every fucking day? Um Dragon's like, I love shaving my head, but I also really like long hair. It's back below my shoulders, butch with with long hair. Yeah. The butcher with long hair is a very rare look, and I fucking love it. Um, oh, yeah, in Miami in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. All of us have had shaved heads and mohawks. <laughs> Schlaf gut. This is um, Frau. Um, 
The dragon says, I actually wonder how much time I have saved in my life not being in front of a mirror. You know what? Actually, sometimes I will be like at work and I'll go to the washroom and look in the mirror and be like, oh, I have like sleep in my eye or like something like that. Something very minor, right? And I'll be like, oh, how did I not notice that? Because I literally don't spend the morning looking in the mirror. I literally don't look in the mirror. I go to the washroom. I brush my teeth. I leave the house. Like, I don't need to like, I think it's a good thing. It's a, it's like a, it demonstrates how little I obsess over my appearance. And considering that I used to be like, you know, super gender dysphoric and like anorexic and all that shit. It's like a huge milestone that I like don't look in the mirror at myself anymore. I don't weigh myself or anything like that. Okay. So. <laughs> so. I would like to keep going with this concept that performing femininity marks one as a potential victim as a subordinate and performing masculinity marks one as a potential victimizer and an, a, and as a dominant and queer theory so <clears throat> it's queer theory it's contention that if you are a woman and you don't signal this potential victimhood so you know you live as a man that you are no longer in the victimizable category this is obviously fucking bullshit FTMs have higher rates of sexual assault than Tim's. Um, it is also their contention that if a man performs femininity, he is no longer in the potential predator category. Why? Because he put on a fucking dress. Clearly his dick doesn't work anymore. We all know. Um, but we all know this is true. This is not the truth, right? Um, and it truly shows how superficial their understanding of like, they truly are obsessed with gender. Gender is based on sex. Who fucking cares about sex? Ignore that shit. It's kind of like, you know how Christianity is based on Judaism? And there's, like, those sects of Christianity that are, like, very, very anti-Semitic and anti-Jewish. And, like, if you tell them that Jesus was a Jew, they'll, like, lose their crap. It's like that. It's like, it doesn't make any sense to, to have one based on the other and, like, ignore the foundations of the first thing. Makes you look like a fucking idiot. Okay. Sabrina says, how do I get over hating being gay? Sabrina, first of all, welcome. I'm very sorry that you are in this situation, but I'm glad that you are self-aware enough to understand the situation that you're in. I really think the number one way to stop feeling shame and self-loathing and hatred and, and a lack of control over your sexuality is to spend time with lesbians who are, like, confident and self-actualized. Like, the first time I talked to a lesbian who was like, yeah, like, I got married to my wife, and then we had, like, kids, and we have a mortgage, and we have a job, and everything was like, I was like, they're happy. They're okay. Like, these kind of things, if you consistently expose yourself to it, you start to think, like, oh, I can be happy. I can be okay. This can be okay. Like, it takes a long time, in my experience, but, oh, hey, Amy. Um, I mean, that's my, um, that's my advice. Yeah. Uh, Dragon says, find your people. I don't know if, if you guys have any other advice. Um, Frau says, one of the tiffs I met at Posey Speaker's Corner this weekend. You mean the one, you went to the one in Nottingham? How did you find that? Um, said she'd go to a men's prison if she broke the law. She literally thought she'd be safe. No, because these people are like cultists, right? Like when you get to that point, you literally are like, it's religious. And I don't mean it's religious as in like, oh, someday I hope I go to heaven. It's like, I believe that heaven exists and that people are already there and I'm going to go there. It's like that level of delusional. I was going to say no offense if you're religion, but I'm like very anti-religion. So actually I don't care. <laughs> but like when they're at that level of delusional, it's not until they actually get assaulted that they realize, oh, fuck, this doesn't make any sense. I've talked, like, I've talked on my channel a lot about the um, epidemic of Tim's raping lesbians. And a lot of the lesb lesbians they're raping, obviously, are TIFFs, right? And so many of these TIFFs genuinely thought, people think I'm a man and I look like a man, so I'm safe. Um... That is not how it fucking works. You are still a female. You are just as victimizable as you've ever been. Aesthetics doesn't change that. Okay. Like, lesbians prove that, right? Like, lesbians are, like, 
unattractive to men. Well, aside from these creepy fetishy ones. Um, for the most part, in our lack of gender conformity and stuff. But, like, that has nothing to do with if they want to victimize us, they're going to fucking do it, right? We're still of the class that the men victimized to feel domination. Um, Amy says, I have never met a fellow lesbian and I don't know how to find anyone. Where do you live? Which state are you in? Are you in the U.S.? Um, okay, uh, where's, uh, Sabrina. I don't have shame. I just hate the lunacy in the LGBT community and how hard it is to find normal people. Okay, well, that I totally fucking feel. And, um... Yeah. I'm I'm sorry, sister. Um... Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Honestly, I would say the best way to find real-life lesbians is to get added to Facebook groups. There are, like, private Facebook groups for lesbians. Like, literally go onto Twitter or Tumblr or something and be like, I'm a lesbian in Germany or wherever you are. Can you add me to some Facebook groups for lesbians? And if you use, like, hashtag radfem, hashtag whatever, gender critical stuff, there will be lesbians who will find you and add you to these groups. That is, like, my number one... But you need to be, like, tenacious about it. Don't do it one time and be like, oh, well, no one found me. No. Like, you have to be on top of it. Um... Yeah. Matt Adams says, This is the most lesbians I've gotten to interact with in years that didn't have the entire new alphabet mixed in. Yeah. Me too. Like, <sighs> right now, my, like, real life lesbians, well, first of all, they're two couples, which is nice. So there's two of them. But one of them is five hours away and one of them is two and a half hours away. So I don't really get to see them very much. And we're never in like big groups. Which is like sad. Um, Postcards in Space says this makes a lot of sense. I grew out of my gender special feels after dating jump down. After dating a misogynist abuser. Mm -hmm. Like, you really, you if you believe it, you're not going to stop believing it until something forces you to stop believing it. And someone telling you that they don't think, like, if this FTM really thinks they'll be safe in a men's jail because they're a man, um, you saying you're not going to be safe is not, it's religious. The Lord is that supposed to do? It's nothing. They need to, like, actually have to confront something like that before they will get out of that mindset, unfortunately. Frau says, yes, I was in Nottingham. The women are inspiring. Most of the public passing agreed with us. The TRAs or predatory men and delusional or autistic young women. Yeah, that's what I observed. Thank you for letting us know. Um, Amy says, it's one of the reasons I like the Radfan community. You can meet lesbians online and not be ashamed. Sabrina says, I go into quote-unquote lesbian Facebook groups and 90 of them were married to... No, no, no. You... No, no, no. You need to go into the private les... There are, like, tons of Facebook groups that are all Radfem lesbians. Like, I'm in some international ones. I'm in some US ones. Um, I'm in at least one Canadian one. Like, if you can find it publicly, it's full of troons. The only ones that are not full of troons are private invite only. And, like, I know that there's at least one in Germany where you need to, like, physically meet up with a woman in person before you get added to that Facebook group. These are the kind of groups you're looking for. If you are not being added to it by a rad femme, this is the wrong group. I know what you're talking about. It's very fucking disappointing. I fucking hate, like, oh, we're lesbians. And it's like, oh, yeah, my husband, my husband, my husband. What fucking lesbian? Shut the fuck up. Okay. Dragon's like, we're going to have to do the underground thing for lesbians already. You know, dude, I already, yeah. That's, yeah, that's the situation right now. Um, sorry, I'm kind of falling behind in the in the live chat. Uh, I'm going to try and catch up with the live chat, and then I'm going to go back to the book and ignore the live chat for a bit. Um, I think I need to keep doing that thing where I cover it with a piece of paper, because otherwise I'll keep just, like, answering it. Gigi says, I feel like all men would choose a women's prison if given a choice. Tips are showing they aren't real men. By that statement, lol, they're choosing ideological purity over self-preserving tactics. That is a very good fucking comment, GG. It was quite insightful. Thank you very much. Okay. Mm. 
<laughs> Karina says, this is why I want to start Benji's Juke Joint, a secret underground society to hook up lesbians in towns and cities all over North America so you ladies can make eyes and chat and connect. Okay, so this is my plan. I wasn't really, like, prepared to announce it on YouTube, but, like, we're an hour and a half into a stream. I don't... Whatever. Who cares? This is my plan. I have done some like lesbian in-person organizing mostly before covid obviously um and then since covid i've been very like if i'm asking women to meet up am i like encouraging them to like you know go against mandates or am i like am i gonna unintentionally be spreading it or something like i've been very self-conscious of that um because you know safety first so not only like interpersonal safety but obviously the virus safety um and um so this is my plan for now I am starting a group called Dyke Out. It is going to be... This is my, like, basic plan of how I'm starting it. So first it will have, like, an Instagram page or Twitter or something. Then it will have an email. And then I will have a stickering campaign with a QR code. The QR code and the email will direct you to, like, a vetting process. Well, the beginning of the vetting process. You have to fill out a Google form with some basic information. You know, like, what are your politics? Are you willing to keep, like, the like some kind of thing to be like a pledge that like you know the women who join the group are going to keep my identity secret i'm going to keep their identity secret then you have to either video chat or in person meet up with these women at least twice and then you can do a group meeting this is my general plan i want to do dyke out ontario first and so i think then i would as the women contact me you know if i have like three women in sudbury ontario then i will drive to sudbury ontario one weekend and we will do like a meetup um, I would like to do this like for about a year and then maybe to do it in Quebec as well. Um, and then the eventual plan would be that it's more like a network where they can keep in contact with each other instead of me. Like I'm a facilitator. It's not about me like doing group meetups. It's about like them being able to contact and connect with each other. And I'm just kind of like starting it for them. That is like my general plan for Dyke Out right now. I'm waiting until like kind of spring because I think in the summer we can do meetups in parks and stuff regardless of what the fuck is going on with covid um so yeah that's my general plan for like lesbian community building in ontario at the moment um because i'm really 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 so fucking sick of the internet despite the fact that i stream for like 30 hours every day um like in person is where it's at i do not i have zero interest in doing any community organizing that is 100 percent online i only want to use online as an avenue to reach the real in-person stuff um but yes, it like also, I mean, it's supposed to be like a, it's going to be like a social thing. It's not like a political thing. Like you need to be a turf to be in it, but it's not like a turf group for doing turf things. It's just like for safety, right? Because if you, it was like a turf group with one TRA, then it's not a safe group anymore, right? And it would, the purpose of it is to kind of be like a social group to hang out and potential dating pool. Hopefully. I just... I'm fucking lonely. Every fucking lesbian I talk to is like, how am I supposed to date? They're all like alphabet wokey idiots. And I'm like, yeah. Um, okay. Dragon says, I see the rainbow flag now. Might as well be a fascist flag. That's how I feel. Um. I know a lesbian and I want to invite her and friends over to a lesbian, but I worry she might be woke and narc me out as a turf in my small town. Oh, fuck, Ocarina. That's tough. I'm sorry. Um, VF says, I used to have a lesbian only circle of close friends. So sad that younger lesbians don't have that. Yes, it's like fucking vital. I don't think you realize how vital it is until you don't have it. Um, Like, I had my lesbian circle of friends and then the lockdown in Toronto at the beginning was really, really intense. And so, like, I literally didn't see them for months. And, like, it wasn't until I couldn't see them that I was like, fuck, I need them in my life. Um, Madman says, it's so hard to find straight-up lesbian spaces online or anymore. Even online, I've struggled. Yeah, yeah. You really need a rad femme lesbian to add you to secret rad femme lesbian things. That is the only way. Um, even in the 90s in the north of England, we had a Tim turn up at a women's only event. He owned a quote-unquote gay bookstore and wrote crap novels and then with the raffle face. Ugh, fucking pathetic men. Um, 
Aquarina says dike out Ontario. I love that dike out. I mean, eventually I'm hoping that it would be like, you know, if not across the country, then at least in a few provinces. Manitoba is very far from Ontario. It's probably just going to be Ontario and Quebec, but. Okay. Love the name already. Thank you. Um, Lisa Michelle, sick of the internet too. Also, welcome back, Lisa Michelle. Lucky women of Ontario. Well, we'll see. Um, <sighs> hers on first. You have to know the old Abbott and Costella to get that. <laughs> I get that. Um, Dragon says, I love my alone time, but boy, I miss hugs. Yes, I also miss these things. Amy said, that sounds awesome. Every girl on Tinder has a she slash they or queer in their bio. Um, Yeah. Sabrina says, I had a lesbian friend as a teenager, but she outed me to a bunch of people against my will too soon, and then she transitioned. LOL, I have a couple lesbian friends now who don't suck. I'm so sorry that your friend did that to you. Like, in radical feminism, we tend to be like, we need to like be accepting and thoughtful and like, you know, compassionate towards women, but it's like, if your internalized homophobia and internalized misogyny results in like real direct harm to other women, that's not excusable. Um, you really you didn't deserve that. I'm very sorry that happened to you. Um, I feel like there's so much trauma in the lesbian community. Like, you know, like, there's like older alcoholic lesbians who end up fucking over younger lesbians. There's like this where you end up transitioning and fucking over someone you out someone. Like, there's so much like compounded trauma in the lesbian community, and I'm just really sorry you went through that. Um. You didn't deserve that. Dragon says, I hate how so many of these women are narking out on other women. Yeah, I actually heard of a situation in Toronto where a friend of mine went to um, went to some kind of like queer women's art event. And she said the entire event, every single piece of art was phallocentric. Like it was sculptures, like phallocentric sculptures. And she literally stood up and she said, as a lesbian, what is here for me? Why am I here? And two old lesbians who are married in their 60s stood up and they told her, don't be exclusionary. This is an inclusive space, like blah, 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 whatever. So because these two older lesbians who are married to each other will never, ever be affected by cotton stealing, they felt happy to throw her under the bus and to um, perpetuate cotton stealing rhetoric against her very valid criticism that this is like an overtly hostile space. Anything that is phallocentric is essentially hostile to lesbians because we fucking don't want that shit. Um, anyway. Aquarina says, um, Aquarina says, I turned out on Saturday with a woman I thought was a feminist, but she wasn't interested at all, and I'm pretty sure the news of me being a quote-unquote bigot will be all over the town by now. I'd love to embrace it. I'm so sorry that that's the situation you're in. That really sucks. Aquarina says, because I am not an asshole who throws kids and lesbians and ladies um, and nature under the bus, I have to channel Karen to remember this. LOLs. Yeah. Sabrina says, my lesbian friend went to a lesbian art event the other day where a trans woman with a boner was a nude model. LOL WTF. That doesn't surprise me at all. And that is like, again, overtly hostile. Like, you know, in the 70s, when the gay, when the gay liberation movement, when they did this kind of shit, because the gay, ugh, the men were all about like, we need like freedom to express our sexuality. And what does that mean? They want to like, in clubs and stuff, they want to be able to like blow each other. Okay. You do you, bro. Whatever. But it's not whatever when this is supposed to be a space for lesbians and gay men. That is overtly hostile, explicitly hostile to homosexual women. So it's not whatever. Anyway, how is it possible that we can look back at these things happening in the 60s and 70s and be like, that's bad, but then it's happening now, that's great. How? Fucking bullshit. Dragon, I was lucky enough to see it when it was still called the Vagina Monologues. Yeah, we need to make like a new like turf monologues TBH. Um I 
VS says gay men always trampled all over us. A postcard from Space Aquamarino. I realized that lately the people who bullies turfs in small towns are the same group of people who bully GNC people in high school. Draw your conclusions. Yeah. Yep. Dragon asks if Giggle's still going. Giggle's still going. I don't think it's me it's reached like maximum velocity yet though. Like or critical mass yet. There's not enough people on it. Um like if 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 all I really like imagine if like half of the turfs from Twitter and Tumblr and YouTube all made a giggle account, then giggle would be rad. There's just not enough women on it. Like the concept I think is good and it's very security based because for each topic you make your own profile. So it's really easy to like be security conscious. Um yeah. I would encourage everyone to download it and make a profile or two on there, but um it's kind of like getter. Everybody was on it at the beginning, and then now it's, like, kind of dead. Um, okay. So then she talks about here how um, the signaling of who is the subordinate and who is the dominant is essential to the ongoing maintenance of the system of gender um, oppression. Oh, yeah, then this is the part where I talked about this, like, half an hour ago or whatever, that, you know, the material cost of forcibly subordinating a class is very high. And so to circumvent this, what they've done is they've they've conditioned women to thinking that it is inevitable or natural that they are subordinate to men and that men are dominant. And this way that you don't need to do anything. They've they've conditioned themselves to to accept this. Okay. So she says here, throughout this essay, I've seemed to beg the question at hand, should I not be trying to prove that there are few and insignificant differences between females and males, if that is what I believe, rather than assuming it? What I have been doing is offering observations which suggest that if one thinks there are biological differences between women and men, which cause and justify division of labor and responsibility, such as we see in the modern patriarchal family and male-dominated workplace, one may not have arrived at this belief because of direct experience or unmolested physical evidence because of our customs serve to construct that appearance and i suggest these customs are artifacts of culture which exist to support a morally and scientifically insupportable system of dominance and subordination also that was like two sentences but she knows how to use punctuation like there is semicolons and colons and stuff um i actually love in philosophy when there is like super long sentences that explain one concept um and when people like Ari Morty try to do that, they look really stupid. <laughs> okay. Um, so it's interesting. Throughout this chapter, she is. She's kind of pointing out both sides. That how women and men are similar. And how women and men are dissimilar. Um, but what she's really asking is for us to consider... In the ways that they are different, is this nature or nurture? And is it a good thing or a bad thing to accentuate and accept and perpetuate no, perpetuate these differences or not? So she's just kind of asking us, think about it. What's different? What's the same? What's good? And what's bad about the differences and the similarities and the way that society treats us based on the differences and similarities? Um, Oh, also, I love the way she uses the word enculturation. I've never come across the word like this before. Um, and I understand what she means. It's similar to conditioning, right? But to do specifically with your culture, I really, really like that word. Okay, so she then says, um, 
Enculturation and socialization are, I think, misunderstood if one pictures them as a process which applies layers of cultural gloss over a biological sub substratum. So it is with this picture in mind that one asks whether this aspect of behavior is due to nature or nurture. And so basically what she's arguing in this paragraph is that if we get to the point where we're asking the question nature or nurture, we've missed the point. Because once you're at the point where you're asking nature or nurture, you're asking, is this a changeable thing or is this an inevitable thing? And when you you get once you accept that this is an inevitable thing, then you're saying it's unchangeable and there's nothing to be done about it. And she thinks that that is the wrong route to take. We shouldn't even get into that possibility in that mindset. At least that's how I'm understanding this paragraph. Um, my observations and experience suggest another way of looking at this. I see enormous social pressure on all of us to act feminine or, ask ma or act masculine. So I am inclined to think that if we were to break the habits of culture which generate the pressure, people would not act particularly masculine or feminine. Yeah. So when you're asking nature or nurture, you're kind of not getting to that point, is what she's saying, I think. Okay. And so she's saying, it's kind of pointless to imagine nature versus nurture and imagine what would, like, a woman who has not been conditioned or enculturated, what would she behave like? Because we do live in a culture. So it's kind of like besides the point. Um, and that we need to focus on how we do it within the culture that we are in. Then she talks about how we can change our habits and our thought patterns to not be like participating in gender to the extent that we are and to not be perpetuating it and being not be part of the pressure that other people feel to um, conform to gender. Like that's the thing too, like, you know, girls wearing makeup, for example, like it starts, it's younger and younger and younger now. Why is that? Like, all it takes is, like, one or two girls in the class to show up wearing makeup to feel make the rest of the girls feel like something is wrong with them. They're not doing it. Um, and so this is, like, habits. Um, and by you yourself conforming to the habits that have that have, are expected of you, you are implicitly pressuring the women around you to do it because you're marking them as other because they're not doing it. Um, Lisa says, Ugh, my 11-year-old niece wears makeup. Yeah, it's horrifying. Um, yeah, so this to me is like one of the most like obvious, the personal is political and like how you can make a difference type thing. Like, you know, if you don't shave your legs, the women around you will feel like that's an option they have maybe. Um, anyway. Yeah. The six year old beauty pageants. Yeah. Matt Adams says kind of like no behavior exists in a vacuum. Yeah, exactly. Um, Yeah, then she talks, when she talks about this enculturization, sorry, enculturation, I'm just going to read this whole paragraph here. Socialization molds our bodies. Enculturation forms our skeletons, our musculature, our central nervous systems. By the time we are gendered adults, masculinity and femininity are quote unquote biological. They are structural and material features of our own body, of how our bodies are. My experience suggests that they are changeable just as one would expect bodies to be slowly through concert practice and deliberate regimens designed to remap and rebuild nerve and tissue this is how many of us have changed when we choose to change from quote-unquote women as culturally defined to quote-unquote women as we define ourselves both the sources of the changes and the resistance to them are bodily are among the, po the possibilities of our animal natures whatever those may be But now, quote-unquote biological does not mean, quote-unquote, genetically determined or, quote-unquote, inevitable. It just means, quote-unquote, of the animal. So what she's talking about is, like, by habitually being feminine, by habitually conforming to the subordinate role, you have, like, conditioned your brain to actually think that way. You have conditioned... 
the thought patterns in your brain to go in that direction. You've conditioned your, you know, if you if you walk in like a ladylike way for your whole life, you conditioned your body that this is what's comfortable, this is what's normal. And this is, you have brought into reality a physical essence of gender that is no longer a thing that you think sometimes. It's, it's a physical fact of your existence, this gender that is inextricably linked with like your behavior and your patterns and your habits, right? And so she's saying, if we know that we can make, that we can get women to this state, by um, enculturation and socialization, then we know it is possible to undo it or to prevent it from happening. And that this is like the resistance. Um, and so that this has nothing to do with what is like genetically determined or what is like in our biology. What we know is that this is something that can be accomplished through socialization and therefore can be undone. Um, VF, I like this this comment. VF says, I sort of get mad when rad femmes focus on the sexualization of drag kings, of drag kids, i.e. boys, ignoring that this is standard for all little girls now. Yeah, I agree. Okay. It is no accident that feminism has oft often focused on our bodies. Rape, battering, reproductive self-determination, health, nutrition, self-defense, athletics, financial independence... It is no accident that with varying degrees of conscious intention, feminists have tried to create separate spaces where women could exist somewhat sheltered from the prevailing winds of patriarchal culture and try to stand up straight for once. One needs to practice an erect posture. One cannot just will it to happen. So this is like, one needs to learn how to say no to men. One needs to learn how to not constantly comfort men. One needs to learn how to not constantly acquiesce to men in order to actually do it. You can't just wake up one morning and decide that you're not going to do it when it's a habit that you've ingrained into your brain for, like, your whole fucking life. Um, just kind of the purpose of my YouTube channel, that you can come here and prioritize women and think about women and get out of that bullshit for a little bit. Okay, um, so, remember how I was like, I don't think she actually really defined sexism because she defined it at the beginning and said this was not a good enough definition? So I'm going to read you the last paragraph. I can't remember what it said. Maybe this is the true definition. Okay. Or your last two paragraphs. Last two paragraphs. The cultural and economic structures which create and enforce elaborate and rigid patterns of sex marking and sex announcing behavior, that is, create gender as we know it, mold us as dominators and subordinates. They construct two classes of animals, the masculine and the feminine, where another constellation of forces might have been might have constructed three or five categories and not necessarily hierarchically related or such a spectrum of sorts that we would not experience them as quote-unquote sorts at all. The term sexist characterizes cultural and economic structures which create and enforce the elaborate and rigid patterns of sex marking and sex announcing, announcing which divide the species along lines of sex into dominators and subordinates. Individual acts and practices are sexist which reinforce and support those structures, either as culture or as shapes taken on by the enculturated animals. Resistance to sexism is that which undermines those structures by social and political action and by projects of reconstruction and revision of ourselves. Okay. So. I have given you my opinion on this essay. Let's see. Okay. Okay. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the washroom and then I'm going to talk to you about what other books I should buy. I will be right back. One second.
Hello, sisters. Mama. 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 Okay, well, Momo's here. Alrighty. So, I'm going to force myself after this stream to not stream anymore today. Four streams is enough for one day. The next essay I'm going to be reading from this is called The Problem That Has No Name. Probably, I will read this on Thursday night. Oh no, wait, I have work on Friday morning, don't I? Give me a second. I, the next week is going to be difficult. I The only day I have off work is Sunday. Hopefully me and my um, roommate are going to play for a duet. A duet. Somebody asked, I think it was Toss Stones who asked for Albignoni. And me and my roommate actually have an Albignoni duet. A couple Albignoni duets ready to go. So might play one tomorrow. Let's see. Friday I work at 5.30. Saturday I work at... Okay. I'm going to tentatively say we are reading the next chapter of this on Friday night. Oh, fuck. Um, I've gotten better at um, scheduling my videos ahead of time. So just turn on your notifications and you'll see when I schedule it. What else? Oh yeah, which book should I buy next? So 100% for sure after we are done this book, which let's see how far we are through it. We are about a... 30% through this book. <clears throat> After that, I'm definitely reading this. 100%. Yeah. Um, and then, after this... Amy says, does anyone know of any good books to recommend to my philosophy teacher who I had a discussion about radical feminism with? She's a lib femme, but I feel like she's smart enough to get it if explained right. I think maybe you need to look at the more um, contemporary stuff. Um, Kathleen Stock's um, Material Girls apparently make... I haven't read it yet. And I'm not going to read it on the channel because I want you guys to fucking buy it with your own money. I don't want you to just listen to me reading it. Um... Maybe I can interview Kathleen Stock though if I like if I read it myself and I do like a video of what my thoughts are about it. Maybe I can interview her. Anyway, apparently Material Girls is very good because it makes the argument of why um, the trans activist postmodern position is actually harmful to themselves, and so how the material position is good for them and for us. Um, so I've heard a lot of people recommend Material Girls as a kind of um, exposing people to this perspective. In like a positive way. Kathleen Stock is a nice femme, right? Like she even used prefers pronouns and crap like that. So I think she's probably a good place to start. Like I would recommend Kathleen Stock before I'd recommend like, you know, Sheila Jeffries or something. Um Yeah. VF says unfortunately we thought it would get better for the next generation of lesbians. We were wrong. It almost feels to me like, I'm not trying to lay this at like the feet of older lesbians, but it almost feels to me like, you know, like in the 70s and early 80s, there was like lesbian bookshops and women's cafes and women's restaurants and like feminist collectives and all this crap. I feel it's almost like the lesbians get like got their eye off the ball for like one year or something. That's all it took for everything to go back to scratch. Like I, I feel it's almost like they were like, it was like a race, like they're going in one direction. And for one second, they looked over there, and it was like, it was over. Like, everything they had done, they had to start from scratch. And it's like, it's kind of depressing. Um, yeah. Okay. Right. Then I have this lesbian psychology essays. I don't know if I feel like reading that next. Let us go to my wish list. 
Un momento, por favor. Wow, I can't believe I've done so many lives. This is my wish list. For fuck's sake. Where is it? Well, apparently I don't have it anymore. That fucking sucks. Okay, well, never fucking mind. <sighs> so, um, any of you patrons might have noticed that I'm like three videos behind in sharing videos with you because I did like three videos like one day after the other and I just like was like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. And it's been like three days now or four days or something crazy. So I need to make all my videos available to everyone. And I also need to schedule the Zoom party for the 40 patrons. The Zoom party seems quite impractical. I think that for what I'm going to do in the future is maybe when I reach like a hundred patrons, I'll do like a Discord chat. Um, yeah. Kara says the trans movement hurts lesbians twofold due to them misrepresenting sexual orientation. And many lesbians identifying outside of their needle sex and orientation completely agree. I remember somebody that I texted the wish list to, but it was like months ago, so it might take a bit of scroll. Oh wait, no, can't you look look at links in iPhone now or something? Only can see the one what? Okay, never mind. Yeah. I have no idea where this wish list is. I literally went and made a specific Amazon account just for this. Maybe that's how I'll be able to find it. I think I know which email it's associated with. Okay. Sabrina says it makes me feel fucked up that testosterone makes so many former lesbians want to fuck men. Like, what is... Is that all it takes? A little boost in sex drive to change female sexual orientation? What is that? Yeah. Um, it is very disturbing. I know what you mean. It's like... I think a part of it might be kind of, I mean, I don't know if this is like, hello, Looney. I don't know if this is like, um, I don't know. Oh, Lady, Lady Studio, don't you, 
Aren't you one of the admin on Lisa Michelle's channel or Radical Ramblings channel? Um, was the thing with sex drive and tea? Yeah. Um, I think part of it is that they is that a thing that really happens? Yes. Part of it is that okay, I will like summarize very quickly the situation. Some women, well, all women when they go on tea, their sex drive gets fucked, right? Some women when they go on tea, their sex drive gets really, really fucked. And they will feel like from what I have talked to these women about, they will feel like maybe Dragon, you can lend some thoughts on this. They will feel um like permanent arousal almost. And so, or like very, very acute arousal. Some women are bi. That is true, VF. But like, I have talked to at least two lesbians who were like, I was hooking up with, um, you know, women. And I was having a lot of sex and masturbating a lot and I never felt like sexually satisfied. And literally one of them was like, I was in a club one night and like all the women there, it's like I had either already hooked up with them and they didn't want to hook up with me or like they weren't like an option for me. And she was like, and I was like, so, um, so like, whatever, that I just was like, you know what? I don't fucking care. Like, I'm drunk. I'm horny. Let's fucking try it and see if it like makes it like go away or like makes it stops my arousal. And, um, and then they're traumatized by it, obviously. Like if they're literally like, genuinely not attracted to men. They're obviously traumatized by it afterwards. Um, the only data we have about this, there's one study, I think it was from the 2008 or something. I really need to find it. Um, and it was showed the inverse, actually. It showed that women who were exclusively heterosexual after, I think it was two years on T, were now like not exclusively heterosexual. Like, they were hetero and bi or whatever. Um, I would really, really be interested to see the same data about lesbians. But... As we know, they're they're never ever going to do any research into the way that um, cross sex hormones affect sexual orientation because that might be a reason to not take hormones, right? And they're not going to find they're not going to research something that might not want people to buy more hormones. So, um, Dragon says, "Yep, I already had a high sex drive with testosterone. Testosterone made me nuts. However high my drive was, I was never into men. Well, yeah." Um, Ladies, I think part of it is internalized. It's not only internalized homophobia. It is definitely internalized misogyny. Have you seen? This is like genuinely very upsetting for me. I've had conversations with these women where they would like scream until they are red in the face that they're a straight man. And like the women that they hook up with are like straight or bi. Like they're not lesbians. Like they're attracted to me as a man. And I think that it's like. They are so insecure about their masculinity because, you know, their manhood is based on nothing. They're so insecure about it that they feel the way... They, okay. Have I ever told you, guys, that I have this, like, hypothesis that it's like, um, like Calvin Gar, yeah. That it's like the more... Um, That is a good way of thinking about a VF. VF says, yes, there is self-harm, but the tea made me do it, kind of. I think I think that's, like, kind of, yeah. Because you also have to consider tea fucks with your head. Not only your sexual orientation, but, like, literally, like, your brain doesn't work properly. <laughs> like, generally, that's my conclusion about tea. So, like, the two things combine. But, um, okay, is my general contention that of Tim, right? As he is on, uh, as he chemically castrates himself and then literally castrates himself as he's removing the male characteristics of his body he like makes up for it by behaving in a more male way like i have literally observed this like before and after not having balls the aggression level goes up and i'm like i think they are compensating for losing this physical characteristic with a with a behavioral um like substitute and i think that i've i observe a similar thing in trans men which is like, or kind of the inverse, is like, the more they start to look like men, the more they realize, because they, you know, they pass, compared to Tim's, decently, the more they start to look like men, the more they, they become, like, hyper-aware they are not a man. And so, as this, as this is occurring, they need to behave more and more like a man, mirror men's behavior more, 
be one of the guys more, be accepted by the men more, get treated by women the way the men are treated more. And they think that through this behavioral, um, this behavioral solution is the, is this, is like solving the problem of their, their physical problem. And like, obviously that is not how it works, but when you, when they get to this point where they are like, wait, what was the question? They turn into cheerleaders for penis. Um, not talking about like, this is the kind of thing that I think is going on. Um, yeah. No, don't be sorry, uh, don't be sorry, Lady Studios. It's like all kind of a similar um, um, topic. Um, Dragon says, "Yeah, I was a lot angrier and couldn't cry." Oh yeah, yeah. I was only able to cry when my twenty-year-old cat died. I'm so sorry. I, um, Dragon says, I'm, "I'm back to being able to cry, and there's a lot to cry about." Yeah, T is like really really powerful stuff um i mean also think consider this if women's sexuality is generally led by our emotions right that is generally what directs our sexuality as opposed to men where it's more visual and you're on t so your emotions are like cut off i've talked to so many people on t who were like when i was on t the only emotion i was capable of feeling was anger and depression or like when i was on t the only i could only feel emotions when i was in like in like very heightened emotional states everything else was like numb and so it's like to me it's like then of course you're not making like sound decisions when it comes to sex partners because the thing that you use to direct yourself to your sex partner is like turned off um anyway i i think it's very complicated and we don't really know exactly what's going on but it is an observable fact that there are lots of women who are exclusively heterosexual who go on tea and then afterwards are having sex that is not exclusively heterosexual. And I'm like, from a macro perspective, this seems like conversion therapy. Why is it that because they're masculine, this is fine and nobody cares? I don't understand. Sabrina says, oh, I'm naturally emotionally pretty numb and it sucks. Um, yeah, I I was very, very emotionally numb for like most of my life. Lady Studio says, wow, now I understand lesbians on T, why they're so angry, they need more compassion. Okay, they do need more compassion, but when it rises to the level of, like, harm to other women, like, there needs to be a line. We can be compassionate for women who have self-hatred to the point of poisoning their bodies and, like, self-harming, right? We can even be compassionate in understanding of why they're behaving in this way and you know why the tea led them to behave in this way specifically or whatever but when it gets to the point um it when it gets to the point of this is hurting other women or this is negatively affecting lesbians it's like there's a hard line to be had there in my opinion Looney says i live in a conservative country i have a tiff friend who refused to admit she's a lesbian and then transed herself and got a bisexual girlfriend why not just be a lesbian i've talked about this before too it's like um so when you add gender, then you can ignore the fact that there's homosexuality. So for example, say I'm a woman and I'm attracted to women, but I'm in denial. Well, if there's a woman who says she's a man and looks like quite masculine, I can trick myself, oh, that's a man. I'm allowed to be attracted to that woman because that's not a woman, that's a man. Similarly, the opposite. If I am a woman who is attracted to women and I'm in denial about this and I become a man, then if I'm attracted to women, now this is heterosexual. So because I've added this layer of gender, it's like a protection to be able to ignore the sex situation. Um, and it's like enabling internalized homophobia to like a really high degree. Um, yeah. No, but G Gigi says plenty of men with normal T do cry, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a way that testosterone affects a woman is not the same way a testosterone affects a man. We're different. Men and women are different. Women's bodies are not designed to handle the male level of testosterone. Um, Lady Studio says, Benji, absolutely agree. I mean, having compassion for them enough to know where they're coming from instead of being reactive. But yes, harm is never acceptable. Yeah, I, I just wanted, yeah, cool. Okay. <sighs> Sabrina says, even though trans men are female, I can't be attracted to them. Some of them look too much like men and I gotta see some titties. I mean, I don't know. My ex 
at the end was identifying as a trans man. With her clothes off, she was a fucking hairy woman. <laughs> like, I don't know. The fact that I, like, you know, dated and had sex with, like, a trans man, like, really proves to me that that is a fucking woman. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, like... Like, when we started dating, she was, like, re-identified. And then at the end, she was back in Looney Town. Okay. Um... Kiara said some trans men still look very feminine even on TV. Yeah. No. I By and large, trans people don't pass. By and large, the project of transition is a waste of time and energy and resources and a recipe for disaster. But I just think, like, you know, generally, there are trans men who pass. And generally, trans women don't pass. I don't know. Sabrina says bisexual women are probably best partners for trans people TBH. Yeah, I think so too. Um, Sabrina says, oh shit, she transitioned again. That sucks. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Frau. Amazing. Frau says you can't run a petrol engine on diesel. Great analogy. Perfect. Oh, and yeah. And Dragon said in its exogenous testosterone too. It's not natural. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've always been into like masks, so... Like, the first woman I was ever attracted to was, like, well, she was straight. Well, she said she's bi, but, like, yeah, she's straight. And um, she was kind of femme. But every other woman after her that I've been attracted to has been mask. I think that something with my attraction to her had to do with the fact that I knew I would never, like, date her or something like that. Do you know what I'm saying? There was, like, some kind of a psychological thing going on there. Um VF says, I think many of them are attractive before T. Yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't date someone who was on T, but someone who's been on T, it's like, whatever. You're like hairier. Who cares? <laughs> um, I don't know. Or like a mastectomy. It's like, you know, I like boobs, but if I don't have boobs, that's that's fine. Who cares? That's fine. Um, okay. So, this is my fourth stream of the day. It's been quite long. We are 100% reading this on either Friday night or Saturday morning. Probably Friday night. Um, if there is a book you would like me to read, feel free to email me. If you want to contribute to my funds for buying books, feel free to send it to me on PayPal. Mm, yeah. So my work week starts tomorrow. I don't have work today. And then I work for like it's unusual. I work for like six days next week instead of five. So my stream schedule will be a little bit different this week. But, you know, as usual, all my stuff is um, scheduled ahead of time and posted. So just make sure your notifications are turned on. Or like if you, if you think I might be doing something on Friday, check on my channel on Friday morning something. Um, um Okay. No, I can only I could only date a woman who's a rad femme. Like that's why my like last relationship was such a disaster because when we started dating she was a rad femme and then she was not. Like that to me is even more important than like anything else like aesthetics wise. It's like that we're on the same page. Everything starts from there. <laughs> um and like if that if that box is ticked a lot of other things, like, don't matter to me. Okay. <clears throat> Frau Fantastic is telling me to eat. I have my shawarma here. I'm going to eat it here. And he says, how the fuck do you turn from a rad from to RTR? It's actually very obvious. Or, I don't know. If you study cults, which I do. Um, once you've been in a cult, your chance of getting into another cult are, like, super fucking high. You are, like, the number one person who is likely to get into a new cult if you have been in a cult before. So, this is what you observe with retransitioners, right? When they're in the cult, they're told, you know, if you do X, Y, Z and attain this level of whatever, you will have peace of mind and peace of body and whatever, right? So, they detransition, get into radical feminism. Radical feminism, you have to, like do like consciousness raising you have to like deconstruct your conditioning you have to like dissect why you feel the way you feel 
you need like it's a, it's like you're opening yourself up to a lot of pain to understanding your pain and there's no easy one two three process i'm going to feel better right and so i think that for a lot of people it's like trying to even regardless of radical feminism trying to get out of that ideology and understand the pain you've been through is so excruciating and time consuming and whatever it seems impossible you try it for a year two years three years it's not working everything is still painful but that's like just because you have an awareness that you are a woman who lives in patriarchy um and so you got sick of the pain it's not going away well, the people, remember they told you if you do one, two, three, suddenly everything's going to feel better? Well, it didn't work last time. But, you know, at least it's like a one, two, three. I know how all that works. I don't even need to learn about how I need this. I know how it all works. I can just jump back in. Super easy. I think it literally is that. That, in a in a nutshell, that's basically kind of what happens. Um, there's another detransitioner I know who grew up like a very fundamentalist Christian. Then... She immediately, when she left her religious family, became like a queer cult, like extremist, like right at the end of extremism, right? When she detransitioned, she didn't go very rad femme, in my opinion. It was mostly kind of gender critical. She didn't go that far. But she was in that position for like a year and then back to fundamentalist religion. Why? Because this is a person who, in their mind, their thought patterns are always like, I'm in, you know, I'm in pain. What do I do? They told me what to do. I'm happy. What do I do? They told me what to do. Like, if you're always in this thought of I'm being told what to do, oh, that's comforting. Like, it gets comforting because you're no, oh, I know what to do. I don't need to think about it. I know how to fit in. And I know that if I fit in, people are going to protect me and praise me and blah, blah, blah. So if it's like, it's very seductive to go back to that instead of being independent. Um, but it's like, it's like a learned dependence. You have to learn to be independent again. That's very tough. While you're trying to learn to be independent, you might think, you know what? This is hard. I'm not doing this anymore. I'm going to go back to being a dependent. Whether it's dependent on, like, the queer cult or a different cult, either way, you've given up your control, and that's easier in some way. I mean, that's generally my position, my understanding of people who retransition. Um, like, you see people will leave, like, Scientology or something, and then they'll immediately jump into, like, another cult. And they think like, no, I'm being rational now. Like I'm thinking for myself now. But they're so comfortable being bossed around and being told what their values should be that it's more comfortable and easy for them to be in a cult than to not be in a cult. Kara says, there's always a red flag when people go from one extreme to the other in a short span of time. They're not really addressing their real issues. Yeah. But it's also totally normal for detransitioners. Like you, you observe this. They go from from like trans extremism usually they have like a couple of months where they're kind of like floating around trans med gender critical esque or something and then a lot of them will go like pretty far to like you know kill all men levels of rad femme and it's from there that they start to like question things and think for themselves and like find their own kind of independent footing um and like why is that it's because of what i just explained so if they're trying if they're trying to be like I'm going to think for myself they are kind of doing that when they like flip to another ideology because what they've done is they've made one independent decision to not do what they were doing before and the one independent decision they made flips them to this new ideology and they're like okay great now this is like within my control and it's not until a few months into it usually that they really understand like okay I'm just following a different playbook and not actually thinking for myself um i don't know that's kind of my broad strokes explanation of the situation um for how fantastic says the neural networks are set down they never go away yeah especially if you grew up um in a like very like high control situation like another a synonym for a cult is a high control group um
exactly mad adam says people like tend to like the path of least resistance that's the thing too with like like people don't actually consider what it means for a detransitioner to detransition like some of the detransitioners i know well all of the retransitioners i know had trouble passing as women when they detransitioned that was a big problem for them like and every single time they left the house it was like they got smacked in the face with like you were on tea people we don't think you're a woman you can't go into the women's washroom you scare women every single day they're getting smacked in the face with this it's painful right so what's the path of least resistance well people think you're a man think you look like a man you're trying to convince people that you're a woman it's easier to just be a man like in their mind right anyway no but vf like i get what you're saying but also it's like i don't know i feel like a lot of people they don't actually want to imagine what it's like that you are a woman and you cannot go into the women's washroom because it's not even it's like and especially the women I'm talking about, they were butch lesbians before. They know what it's like to go into the washroom as a butch lesbian and for women to be a bit freaked out. It's a different level. When you go into the washroom, people think you're literally an actual biological man. Um, like, one one of the, the women I know who retransitioned, who she told me um, when she detransitioned that she was so happy that she could be a lesbian again. She was like, I don't like it when women look at me and they're scared of me. She's like, I want them to know that I'm one of them. Like, I'm on your side. And, like, she basically was saying that she missed sisterhood. But then she ended up finding that, she, to her, personally, she felt alienated more than before. Um, and I'm not saying this is, like, a good reason to retransition. I'm just saying it's, like, you can't look at that stuff and just tell them, oh, it doesn't matter. But it's because it's, like, every fucking day they go out into public and women, you know, like, cross the street to get away from them and stuff like that. Like, obviously this has a long-term effect on your self-perception. Um... Yeah. Yeah, but VF, did you do it to yourself? Because that's also a big, huge part of it is their own guilt. They're like, I have to struggle with this every day and I'm the one who put myself in this position. Might as well kill myself. Like, yeah. Yeah. No, what's your what's saying here, Dragon? Oh, here. Dragon says, "When I still had tits, I got screamed at in in a gym by these women in a changing room. I never stripped so fast in my life just to show them I had tits." Yeah. But VF, they're not pretending it makes them men. Society is treating them like men. It's not... If society treats you every single fucking day like a man, it's not like an inconceivable thing to be like, it would be easier if I just was a man. Um, like, these are women who, like, for years are like, I'm a woman, I know I'm a woman, that's okay. Like, it's okay, people treat me bad, it's okay, it's okay. And then, like, they just can't deal with it anymore. Um, it's really easy to say, like, well, just deal with it. But, like, if this led them to be, like, to the point of suicide to start testosterone. Obviously, they were never equipped to deal with it in the first place. Now there, it's even harder to deal with it. You can't just be like, deal with it. There, whatever the if they had to, rec to resort to maladaptive coping mechanisms in the first place, when it was easier because they were still look like a fucking woman, then obviously, if they get to the point where like it's just as much of a problem as it was before, they're gonna probably resort to the maladaptive coping mechanisms again, unless they have like a lot of support. And get past, like, the psychological barrier of, like, it's easier to ignore things than to deal with things. I don't know. I think a big part of it, too, is um, prior, like, how they were indoctrinated and how long they were indoctrinated. Um, you, there's some women who detransition. They're, like, their involvement with the trans community was very limited. It was, like, a year or a few months or something. And then they, like, transitioned and they kind of weren't involved with it anymore. I think they have a much easier time detransitioning than the ones who, like 
especially the ones who are really mentally ill. The ones who are really mentally ill get like a codependent relationship with the trans community, like constantly, constantly, like completely their life is entangled with the trans community. So like part of it too is that when they leave that, they no longer have like this emotional support to this unhealthy degree and they're looking to recreate that because it's like they're so used to it. So I think that like the ideological involvement before and has a big effect on like how things turn out after. Yeah, exactly, VF. Like, you're saying this, and people are like, I've never seen the unisex washroom. It's really easy to say, oh, just deal with it. Like, I was on a road trip with my girlfriend. We were in the car for eight hours. Every single stop we stopped at only had men and women's washrooms. She peed in the fucking bushes because she was like, I don't want to scare the women, and I can't go in the men's washroom because I'm not a man. So it's really fucking easy to be like, just deal with it, when, like, they literally, there is no, like, way to deal with it. Like, it's the way to deal with it is to, like, isolate yourself, basically. That's true. But VF, the people I'm talking about are people who are trying to detransition. They're not lying and saying that they're a man. They're getting treated like society, by society, like they're a man. It's kind of like, yeah, the path of least resistance. LARPing as a man isn't, an, isn't the answer. No, but it's the path of least resistance, maybe. I fucking wish it wasn't, but for some people it seems to be. And like, that's heartbreaking. <laughs> yeah, that too. Mad Adam says, um. It's pretty hard, um, to where transness is essential to their entire personality due to the obsessive nature of it and trying to figure out who you are without that crutch. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not only the communal aspect, but the self-perception. Like, this is something that, um, like, I'm lucky because I had music. But a lot of, like, the Peak Resilience Project, I think it's, um... Oh, what's her name? Is it Dagny? I can't remember. One of the Peak Resilience Project women talked about this. Because they were like, while I was being trans, it was the only thing that I did. It was like, I never had, like, interests or hobbies or, like... I didn't do like go to sports games or whatever. All I did was be trans. So as soon as I stopped being trans, I had like, nothing to do in my life. Um, and like a lot of D trans women, like I went through this phase, go through a phase of like you start watching the old YouTube videos, like the transition timelines and stuff you used to watch. Cause it's just like, it's like habitual. It's like that kind of used to be like a self soothing behavior. And so now when you're stressed out, you go and do that. Even though you don't believe that and you don't want that, it's like a self-soothing thing. And then it fucks with your head. Um, like, when I first detransitioned, I was like, I need to... I don't want to stop exposing myself to people who have different opinions than me. So my thought was like, I shouldn't, like, block everyone I know who's transitioning. Because um, I should be able to, like, see things outside my opinion or worldview or whatever. And... Um, <clears throat> Um, I don't even know what I was saying, but okay. I'm gonna let you guys go. Um. Yeah. Well, what did you say? <laughs> Sabrina says my coworkers ask if it bothers me when people call me sir and honestly it doesn't but I worry some people with her upset and assault me or something like that yeah and like I don't care if people call me like sir or whatever well 
I kind of care because I'm like, why are you stupid and blind? <clears throat> but like, aside from that, um, but I think if you've been on T and you know the reason it's happening is because of your own actions, it's like every time that happens, I think it compounds your guilt or something like that. I mean, that's like definitely the impression I've gotten. Um, so it's not like this exactly the same. Um, Oh, Momo. Momo, say goodbye. Say goodbye. Burr. Dragon says that, yeah, I'm still in the guilt phase. I feel you, sister. Um, it's tough. Be kind to yourself. Lady Studio says, I get sir so many freaking times over the phone and rarely in person. My newest gym tried to give me a tour of the men's room because they thought I was a dude. Embarrassing. Yeah. Well, it should be embarrassing for fucking them. Fucking idiots. Um, Frau Fantastic says, Good night, Traumschon. <laughs> JK Drooling says, Good night to Momo. Momo, say good night to JK Drooling. Well, she seems kind of unhappy about it now. <laughs> okay. See you, sisters. Bye. Probably on Friday. Okay, bye. Have a good week.